This is ISCI 2001, Chapter 23, Ecology and the Environment, Part B. There are four themes for this lecture, community habitat and niche, kinds of organism interactions, population characteristics, and the population growth curve. Community habitat and niche. People approach the study of organism interactions in two major ways. The first is they study all of the organisms that interact with one another. This is called the community and the relationships among them. They also study the detail um, ecological relationships of a certain species. So they study them um, first as a community and then they can study them as individual species. Habitat and niche. There's a major difference between habitat and niche, although they are frequently um, uh, confused. The habitat is the specific place within an ecosystem where an organism lives. Okay, so it's just the place. The niche is the specific functional role of an organism and the way it go, goes about living its life. Um, for example, you could use, um, take the honeybee. The place that it lives is a hive. It lives in a beehive. Okay, that's its habitat. Its niche is the beehive that is in the tree and also the things around it such as um, it making honey, it taking care of the queen bee, um, it pollinating the flowers in the area around it. So the niche is the environmental factors also. The habitat is only where it lives. This is a picture of a koala. Um, you can see it's living up in the bamboo tree. Um, so the top picture is the habitat. The bottom picture is it caring for its young. It has two baby cubs. Um, it's still in the tree. So it's the interactions, not just with the tree, but with um, living things also, like it's young. Kinds of organism interactions. Okay, we're gonna talk about predation. So that's gonna be the predator and prey relationships. And then we're gonna talk about symbiotic relationships. And symbiotic relationships are the parasitism, commensalism, mutualism. And then finally, we're gonna talk about competition between um, a species in general and then a competition within the community. Predation, your predator-prey relationship. This is any organism that is gonna feed one time off of a prey. So for example, uh, you can see that the lioness has killed the zebra. Uh, the lioness will eat its fill of the zebra and then leave it and then the scavengers will come along to finish it off. Um, this is not a relationship uh, like we're going to talk about in a second with the parasitism. Um, this is just a one-time deal. It's like the fox chasing the rabbit, killing the rabbit and eating it. Um, or the cat catching the mouse and eating the mouse. Um, it's not going to keep going back once it's eaten it. Parasitism is um, where one species benefits and one species is harmed. So you have here an example um, of a leech on fish, and then you have an example of the tapeworm life cycle. Tapeworm is transmitted through fleas. Um, basically what's happening is we know that tapeworms will live in the intestines and will absorb the nutrients of the food that is eaten therefore um, depleting that host of the nutrients that it is supposed to be getting so it can eat and eat and eat and eat and it will still lose weight um, because that tapeworm is going to be growing um, and not just growing but it will also be multiplying um, because they're hermaphroditic so they'll be um, generating more tapeworm inside of that uh, inside of that animal with the leech on the fish, the leech uh, will s attach to the fish, drink its spill of the blood. Um, typically, if there's only one leech, it's not going to hurt them too bad. If there's more than one leech, it can actually suck the whole blood supply um, out of a small animal like this fish. So definitely, leech is benefiting. Um, fish is definitely uh, being harmed by that. Commensalism is our next type of symbiotic relationship that we're going to talk about. Um, if you don't know what this is up in the tree, this is called mistletoe. Um, mistletoe is actually um, an organism that feeds off of the tree. Well, it doesn't feed off the tree, but it, it uses the tree to help it get its um, nourishment. So the tree is not harmed. Um, it's not going to kill the tree, but the mistletoe is definitely benefited. So commensalism, one organism is benefited. One organism is not benefited, but it's also not harmed. So it's just kind of neutral. It's just kind of there. Mutualism. 
okay, mutualism is where both species benefits. If you look at both of these pictures, you've got um, on the top left an insect, a bee, with the flower. On the bottom right, you've got the hummingbird with the flower. What's happening is, is, is the flying organism is actually getting benefit from food, okay? The flower is getting benefit because the pollen from these flowers are being transferred from itself to another flower, thus creating um, cross-pollination and making it where um, the species remains alive. Another type of mutualism um, would be one where um, we have beneficial bacteria that live in our bodies. We call them the real catchphrase right now is pro probiotics. Basically what these probiotics are is they are uh, bacteria that live naturally inside of our gut or intestines um, and helps us to break down food. What happens when these bacteria do this is it releases more nutrients so that we can benefit from it more. That's why we call it beneficial bacteria. Now with um, herbivores, most herbivores like cows, um, goats, any type of um, mammal that's going to be eating specific like grass, hay, um, just complete uh, vegetation, they have beneficial bacteria that live in their gut also where um, when the cows eat the grass, um, that grass is composed mainly of cellulose which is a type of sugar, um, humans cannot break that sugar down at all. So if we were to eat grass it would give us no benefit whatsoever. Uh, we would receive no nutrients from that. When a cow eats that grass, um, it'll chew it, swallow it, it'll go down into uh, its first stomach, it has more than one stomachs, it'll go down into its first stomach, that bacteria will start working on it, it'll regurgitate it and that's what we call chewing its cud. Um, it's actually re-chewing that grass, it'll swallow it again, the bacteria will help break down more of it, it'll regurgitate it again and keep chewing on it and it's that bacteria that is breaking down that cellulose so that the cow can get the nourishment from it. That is a definite mutualistic relationship where both the cow is benefiting and the bacteria because the bacteria is being fed by the cow and the bacteria is releasing the nutrients that the cow needs from um, the grass, therefore benefiting both organisms. Competition. In this picture we have one species competing for food. Um, these lionesses have, uh, have killed this animal and what they're doing is they will actually have a power struggle once the uh, the meat starts getting depleted um, you will see the higher ranked lioness finishing uh, the meal of, of the beast now when they're finished with the part that they want you'll actually have hyenas and other scavengers come in but sometimes hyenas like to challenge the lionesses for food especially if it's only one or two uh, lionesses there and there's a pack of hyena and then they will actually compete and if it's a big enough pack of hyena then the hyena will get the food um, and the lions will be left with what's over with what's left over so um, there's definite competition not just within a species but also within the uh, community population characteristics. A population is a group of organisms of the same species located in the same place at the same time. For example, Bainbridge, Georgia. It is one specific place. It's one place. We're all here at the same time. Um, so the human population would be what's counted for this um, time frame. And populations can rise and fall over um, multiple years. Now, the differences in population characteristics um, are divided kind of into five categories. You've got gene frequency, you have age distribution, sex ratio, population density, and population pressure. For gene frequency, here we have a map of the world. Um, it's showing you the percent of population that has O blood type. You can see that in uh, South America, it is 90 to 100 percent of the population has a type O. That's indicated by your blue color. Um, as it travels up through Central America, it also has 90 to 100 percent blood type. Okay. The next step down from that 80 to 90 percent, you can see it's spreading through the United States. You can see also some different patches of uh, strictly type O blood type. For example, in our area where South Georgia is, um, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, you've definitely got a lot 
of blow of um, O blood type, uh, 90 to 100 percent, and also in Florida. Now you can see as it's spreading out, you've got 80 to 90 percent that uh, covers the majority of the northern part of the United States, Canada, uh, going into Alaska. Alaska also has a lot of 90 to 100 percent blood type but you also have to remember that their population is not very dense there and we'll talk about population density in a minute um, what's really cool to notice is if you look over at Africa Europe Asia Australia you don't really have any places it's 90 to 100 percent of type O um, blood type you see more um, that it's about 50 to 60 percent or 60 to 70 percent that's the predominant color there um, so it's it's really cool to be able to track you can actually track populations by doing the blood type um, if you see from South America on up to Central America you can see where um, the migration pattern is occurring because as um, people with blood with O blood type I continue to uh, multiply create children um, that number is spreading out through the United States and very soon it would be um, a good hypothesis to say that you're going to have the majority of the United States between 80 to 100 percent of um, type O blood it's almost there already now over at Asia um, with Asia you have primarily between 50 to 70 percent you've got that very light cream color and the light orange but you can also see how uh, there are different populations that are spreading um, in Africa you've got the 70 to 80 percent and that will spread type O um, blood type is becoming very 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 prevalent so if you have type O blood then if you ever need blood then you should be in good standing um, depending on your RH factor but we won't get into that so look over at uh, Australia if you notice the heavily pop heavily populated area uh, the northern part of Australia um, they've got 80 to 90 percent uh, type O blood in the uh, central part of Australia where it's lower 50 to 60 they also have a lower population there so it'll be interesting to see as that population, if that population spreads there to the outback, um, what the gene frequencies are going to do if it's going to become more uh, type O blood. And it's also going to be uh, really neat to see, uh, you know, in 20, 30 years, um, what the gene frequencies are then compared to what they are now age distribution. This is an age distribution um, from Anchorage, Alaska. You can see the top uh, percentage of population is in that yellow bracket with the 25 to 44 years. The next one is going to be 29.1 percent with the 0 to 17 population. Now the other ones seem quite low but let me explain. In that 25 to 44 age range that is the prime um, childbearing years. That is when the majority of people are going to have their children. It's between the ages of 25 and 44. Um, that is a very high percentage uh, of people because we just we that's the years that most people really, really, really thrive. When they produce children, that bumps into the zero to 17 percent age group. And that is a large span of years. That's 17 total years um, for 29.1%. Why it drops when, I, when it's the 18 to 24, that's, that's a 6 to 7 year span compared to a 0 to 17 year span. Um, what you need to realize is it's not because there's that many people dying between the ages of 17 and 18. It just means that, that uh, it actually is a larger or a the first one is a larger group of people being surveyed compared to the smaller 18 to 24 um, age group. Now when you pass 25 to 44 um, you do see a decline of human population because of um, typically because of heart attacks, strokes, that kind of stuff especially as you get uh, closer to the 60s. Um, so you do see it drop off and then the 65 and above keep in mind that this is Anchorage Alaska and their life expectancy there is a little bit shorter than in the continental US it's got harsher conditions it's colder uh, they're more isolated they don't um, get as many medical supplies as as we have access to 
so that is one of the reasons for such a, a huge uh, decrease in the population at the 65 uh, and up range. Sex ratio. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, basically it, it, this is a map that's just showing where it's prim uh, primarily male, where it's primarily female. Uh, the blue is primarily male. Uh, red is uh, more female. And then you can see the different colors in between um, that just represent a different mixture of the male and female population population density. You know, before we move on to population density, let's go back to sex ratio real quick. Um, it is becoming more prevalent um, in over in the Middle Eastern countries that if it's, uh, if the woman finds out that she's pregnant with a girl, um, the government doesn't really want them to have girls. They want them to have boys. And you see a lot of infanticide, which is uh, the killing of infants, if they're girls. Uh, they can be completely healthy. And this is going on now, uh, today. <laughs> and so we're seeing a huge rise of population of boys in the Middle East. And it's because um, either the girls are aborted when they find out that they're girls, or uh, once they're born, even without the parents' consent, the doctor will kill the infant. So um, if you go to, uh, there's a website you can go to. They're making a movie. It's www.itsagirlmovie.com. And if you go to that, it'll give you some more information. But that's just something that's, uh, you know, uh, current issues going on right now with, with uh, that sex ratio. But what they're going to see is as that population gets older, that population of children, there's going to be too many males versus females. Uh, there's not going to be enough females um, to help put, push that population along, and so they're actually going to see a drastic decrease um, of, of citizens in their culture. So um, that's just something that you know is uh, is is horrible that's going on. Also, over in China, um, they're restricted to two children and most families want boys. And so they will either, if they don't abort the child, um, if the child is born, if it's in a city, then it'll be taken to an orphanage if they don't want it or left out on the street. Um, you also see issues where uh, the family may have a girl um, and then the, uh, later on they have a boy and then they find out they're pregnant again and they have the choice of either keeping that the new baby um, and if it's a boy typically they will keep that boy and put the girl out on the street or either put the girl uh, into an orphanage depending on how old she is so um, that's just something that's currently going on right now and um, that we need to be aware of all right so what you're seeing here is population density by county um, I want to point out at the bottom uh, let's look at our at our legend or our key persons per square mile. If it is less than 10 people per square mile, it's going to be yellow. If it's between 100 and 200, uh, it's going to be blue. 10 to 50 is going to be green. 200 to 500 will be purple. 50 to 100 people per square mile will be dark blue. And then greater than 500 people will be uh, the dark red. What really jumps out at you at this map is the yellow. Um, you hear songs, wide open spaces. Um, primarily the reason why you've got um, less than 10 people per square mile is either it's going to be harsh conditions or it's going to be uh, ranches, farmland, um, that kind of thing. So if you look out like towards Nevada, um, Utah, those places, they're not heavily populated, um, mainly because of desert type area, also uh, Arizona. If you look further east, uh, you can see <laughs> where that Mississippi River kind of kind of divides everybody. Um, what you're going to see is on the eastern side of the United States, population is going to definitely pick up. Now you have to remember our country was started 
uh, in New England, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, all of those New England states. And so they are going to be more heavily populated because that's where our nation started. And it spread out from there. Um, so you're going to see a lot of the, the darker colors and more heavy uh, population colors there. Now you will see some yellows here and there and it's mainly because it's uh, either going to be mountainous, it's going to be uh, or undesirable places to live um, is primarily why it's yellow. If you look down in Florida there's one little yellow spot on the uh, on the bottom and then there's one little yellow spot over on the panhandle. Uh, at the bottom that's where the Everglades are so that's why you're going to see that yellow and green is because you're not going to have very many people living in the Everglades. <laughs> All right. So, but if you look on up, uh, the green places the m is primarily farmland, uh, at least in the southern United States, south, south southeastern United States. You're going to have a lot of farmland. If you look on the western side of our country, uh, you see lots of green uh, that shows 10 to 50 people per square mile. Um, that's mainly because, like, especially up in the northern part, it, it's that's wine country. That's where the vineyards are and um, the good wine making places. So you've got lots of, uh, you can call it farmland, it's, it's just vineyards. Um, so that's one of the reasons why that part is not heavily, heavily populated until you get on down into uh, middle to southern California. But basically, um, I just want you to notice that you are going to see uh, some more heavy populations along coastal areas. You can see down in Lake Mobile, Alabama, um, the tip of Texas, uh, coastlines of Florida. You're going to see more heavy um, populations located there. Um, same thing over on the western starboard of the country. If you see uh, down into California, you're going to have your... 200 to 500 and your 100 to 200 um, locations because those are desirable places to live. Population pressure. Um, the evolutionists, they all say that we came from Africa and you can see that 130,000 um, years ago uh, Africa was basically the birthplace, the motherland. Um, as people began competing for food, competing for resources, competing for space, they branched out and you can see a logical um, progression of the years. In 100,000 years they went to the Middle East uh, and continued over into, uh, into Asia and down into uh, Australia, also up into Europe. Um, they didn't start going north into Europe until a little bit later because uh, it was so cold it was still in the ice age so until that started melting down and getting warmer uh, they didn't go up north um, that's why it took them so long to get across the Bering Strait and into um, Alaska and North America and down into finally uh, Central and South America the population growth curve this is a curve that's used to describe situations where a species is introduced to a previously unutilized area you have natality and you have mortality. Natality is the number of new individuals added to the population by reproduction per thousand individuals. Mortality is the number of individuals leaving the population by death per thousand individuals. So this is not like on an individual number uh, basis. This is a per thousand individuals basis. Components of a growth curve is you're going to have a lag phase uh, which is the beginning of it. Then you have your exponential growth phase, which is where it starts rising, uh, the population starts rising. You have stable equilibrium phase or stationary. This is at the top where it kind of plateaus. It's reached its carrying capacity. Um, and then you're going to have your death phase or your decline um, so that it can get back down towards the true carrying capacity, the carrying capacity average. Um, and it will dip below that line before it uh, pops back up, but we'll talk about that more in a second. This is just a picture um, of bacteria. You've got your lag phase that begins on the left side. It grows up in your exponential phase. It plateaus at your stationary phase, and then you see the decrease in the death phase. Um, now let's pretend 
okay we're just going to pretend that there is a line drawn um, you see where the word lag phase is an exponential phase let's say that there's a straight line drawn across those words okay what's going to happen is when that death phase uh, when the line goes down eventually it's going to plateau again before it goes up into the lag phase okay or actually that plateau is the lag phase so it'll go down into the lag phase um, before it hits the exponential phase and once it does that it pops up again so you have this line um, that's drawn and the blue line is going to weave in and out now the line that we're pretending to draw across the words lag phase exponential phase all the way across um, that is your carrying capacity okay and this blue line is going to make a nice little weave pattern up and down 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 where the carrying capacity goes along um, the average of that line so that you will see um, and I can show you this in class also if you'd like me to uh, expound upon it further um, it's very important that a species stays right along the carrying capacity if it doesn't it can if it goes up too high it can overeat uh, and actually kill off the vegetative um, species and so they'll end up dying um, they'll starve to death I'll give you a story of that um, up where I was raised up uh, close to Birmingham Alabama um, there is a mountain it's called Oak Mountain and you can't hunt there I mean they've got it's a it's a state forest a state park so you can't hunt there well what happened was the deer population uh, kept rising and kept rising and kept rising because you can't hunt there and they have no natural predators there um, <clears throat> so what <clears throat> Birmingham actually did the city of Birmingham is they had it where hunters could come in and uh, sign for a waiver that would allow them to hunt in Oak, Oak Mountain uh, State Park and so they closed down the park uh, to all uh, civilians except for those hunters because what had happened was there were so many deer that they had stripped the trees of the bark um, which causes insects and fungus and stuff like that to be able to attack the trees and so it was killing the trees they had eaten all the grass they had eaten all the vegetation there was nothing left for them to eat and all of these deer were starving to death um, so these hunters knew going into it when they went in to hunt these deer they were not going in for deer meat um, because these deer were going to be very scrawny and just um, very unhealthy uh, because they were so starved so if you don't have a natural predator in the system and you get one species that just gets too high that's not being preyed upon they can kill all the other species below them so it's very 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 important that um, species stay within that carrying capacity so that they don't destroy the ecosystem which is what essentially was happening now it's been a, a close to 10 years since that happened up in Oak Mountain and now they they have a very um, abundant amount of vegetation not too much but um, perfect for what their needs are and um, the deer population is being controlled so they do let hunters come in now um, during deer season uh, they close down the park to allow those hunters to come in so that the deer population does not get up too much but the hunters also know that when they come in even today that they're not killing the deer for the meat um, they're killing the deer to help with population control so the standards that we talked about we talked about energy flow which was the demonstration of understanding of the intricacy and the concepts of food webs um, the interdependence of life we covered lots of these standards uh, the first was to demonstrate an understanding of interdependence among community members this was like the niche how they interact with each other uh, how the community interacts with each other the predator prey relationships the um, symbiotic relationships the competition relationships all of those factors um, went into that then you then we distinguish between autotrophic and heterotrophic organisms those are your autotrophic would be your uh, your producers um, the vegetation and stuff like that that grows heterotrophic are the things that eat those we demonstrated an understanding of symbiotic relationships that was your commensalism mutualism and parasitism we demonstrated an understanding of predator prey relationships strategies and adaptive significance 
We uh, were able to recognize the characteristics of different populations. We were able to demonstrate an understanding of basic population dynamic structure demonstrate an understanding of the importance of the birth and death rates and how important that is uh, for it to stay among that carrying capacity. Then we were able to demonstrate an understanding of the components and limiting factors of a habitat and niche and, a ca and the carrying capacity. And remember that limiting factor is primarily food, water, and space to live. So if you run out of food, water, or space to live, that is definitely a limiting factor that could affect the carrying capacity um, that could affect the amount of uh, organisms that can live there and if they need to um, disperse and go to other places. Now I would like to say this, um, if you have never seen the movie um, The Lorax, uh, it's a Dr. Seuss, it's a, uh, I've never seen the older one, I, we just saw uh, with my son the younger, uh, the, the newer version um, of The Lorax and if you haven't seen it, or if you haven't seen it in a while, I, I suggest that you do go and get it and watch it. And it shows how, um, you know, the Lorax is the protector of, um, of the forest. And he talks about it towards the end, which I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it all away for you, but um, when all the trees are gone and the animals have to leave, he said, I'm sending them somewhere else because there's nothing here for them. And I hope that they can find something um, or a better place than what it is here. Um, there's a lot of, of environmental, um, uh, not just environmental vocabulary that's used in there, but a lot of ethical uh, reasoning and stuff behind it. And um, it's, it's a really, really good movie to watch. And you can relate it not just to environmental uh, things, but there's a quote in there, and it's one of my favorite Dr. Seuss quotes. And it says, unless someone like you cares an awful lot, nothing will change, it will not. And um, I absolutely love that quote, but it, it's not just an, environment, an, an environmental thing. It, it also goes for um, our life in general and about the things that we don't like uh, that goes on around us. And it, nothing will change until someone cares a whole awful lot. Um, so um, just go out and see if you can get that movie and, uh, and watch it. It, it. It's really cool. But um, other than that, make sure that you don't forget uh, to go to Georgia View and participate in the discussion for the lecture. And please do not forget to take your online quiz. We had a couple of people not take it last week. Um, so please, please, please don't forget that. And I look forward to seeing your discussion. Have a great day.